please welcome most graciously our beloved Hassan Duray. Neighborhoods became their neighborhoods. 
streets became their streets, and everything that walked or crawled or drove on them was under their mercy. They decided who lived and who died, who was maimed and who was spared, who was shot and who was sliced. No child should have to know all this, no child anyway. With the use of a few old tires and barbed wire, they would build a flying roadblock. Flying would first the mobility of the roadblock. They could move it from block to block, so people never knew what to expect. And surprise is the hallmark of any good war. Those first few weeks of war, everything seemed to stand still. If you moved, you were dead. If you drove too fast, you were dead. If you walk, walked too slow, you were dead. The snipers would get you crossing from your bedroom to the kitchen. Boiling coffee by a window could be your end, and so everybody froze. The streets were empty and silent except for the burning tires. Everyone held their breath as if by doing so, they could make the war go away, and Mary Rose would return.
A cup of sweet, warm milk, and they sleep and never dream of Mary Rose, their mother, four pieces under a bridge. And another friend's mother was, was shot. The same year. And his name's Hattie, and the poem's called Wild Hattie Sleeps. Curfew like any other night. She walks home, her heels echoing through the hollow buildings. Her son sleeps in their apartment two buildings away. Her flashlight trembles. She stumbles over a mound of Beirut garbage. A man with an RPG on his shoulder lurks on a corner, waves at her. Her neighborhood, born, raised, married, and widowed on this street. Waiting for the elevator, her keys ringing in the dark corridor, she sighs. Hattie's mouth open, sleeping safe under his blanket. She will put her head next to his on the pillow and forget the war. One, two, three shots. Blood drips from the elevator door. Upstairs, Hattie turns over and sleeps on his stomach, breathing lightly into his pillow, waiting for his mother's damp breath to warm the back of his neck. I didn't know about Buffalo poems until I attended P4P. Um, well, I was here three years ago as a visitor. But I think Boyer would be my Buffalo poem. And Edomese is a Lebanese poem. And the quote is, have you gone mad? Please do not write about these things. I need to write about how a stray bullet chooses a neck, a temple, and buries itself in gut. How a mother waits in the dark for her son, 50 pieces in a sack delivered to her doorstep. How toes curl unto themselves and skin hardens and turns coarse like burnt sugar. How teeth seem brighter on burnt skin, calling us moment miss. How the hair is lumped in blue with blood. How eyes without lashes seem surprised. 144,000 and counting. I need to write about these things because I need to forget. Somebody remarked that that line meant that I need to remember. And um, I'm still wondering about that three years later. Um, this next poem is called Far From America. And it, it, it came out of my intense frustration over the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I actually wrote it really far back. I wrote it in 1991, I think, when the peace conference was just beginning, one of many, many peace conferences. Um, but I was sick of the whole, my land is more important than your land, and I'm, my life is more, more important than your land, and my life. And it just was, it just, it's the debate that is, we have, we have seen here today. Um, and so I wrote this for, um, for, for my frustration. It's called Far From America. One, the storm gathers over Ankara, pushing south. Earthquake falls, quiver, and people all run down to sea, while inland snipers with yellow teeth and silver bracelets aim at foreheads, necks, temples, Full moon on August nights, warm <coughs> yellow mist hangs low over bays where Phoenicians once caught tender red mullets at dawn. It is for Phoenicia they are fighting, for the column of fish and dynamite at dusk, rubber dinghies, Israeli patrol boats, disgorging terrorists and Levi's who congregate on beaches of powdered bones and forgotten wooden boats while I buy peaches at an open air market and bolder. It is only the dying who forgive. Two, peace conference. It is for power they are talking, for stone houses drawn on shaded strips of maps and the soil that runs as blood in farmers' veins. It is for history they are fighting, olive branches and parting seeds, for candles at midnight and grape leaves stuffed with a mutilated arm, calls to prayer, ID checks at midnight, and children out of school, destroying barbed wire and fundamentalists with candles and cafes. 
Yes, for land they are fighting, for the column of gas chambers, mosques, and rain seeping through tin roofs, for military telegrams, bulldozed cherry trees, and the dampness of Polish camps. Three. Only the dead touch cold bodies, swallow stones and olives with pits. Only the dead shed religion like dog hair and maize, freeing to the ozone and mound, in a tube whose ashes gliding over warm Mediterranean waters. Only the dead truly converse from Gaza to Auschwitz. Only the dead discuss stone and gas and dance with each other. Four. It is for German fog they are afraid, for Uzis in village squares, scuds after midnight, and boys went away in pajamas while I juxtapose two people's pain on canvas and leave it to the living to thin the paint. Israel invaded Lebanon in 1982. Um, I didn't know June Jordan's work back then. Uh, I, I, I knew her work, but I didn't know her. Uh, and I found a quote that inspired this next poem. The quote is, I was born a black woman, and now I'm become a Palestinian. And the poem is the confirmation of anger, 1982. A relative of mine had, had gone to, um, before I read the poem, um, had gone to live in the south of Lebanon. And uh, she had four children, and she had grandchildren. And uh, when the Israelis invaded, uh, their six-story building, all the buildings were um, deprived of electric power and water and all sorts of things. Um, so she left her children and went down to the corner of water uh, main to fill up buckets. They can drink and wash. And when she was away, um, the jets came and uh, her, the building collapsed. And so she came back and found her children and her friends being dead. The Confirmation of Anger, 1982. Every night, the woman of Sidon skips the streets dressed in white shawl and plastic slippers with plastic fuchsia rows. Her water broke. When F-16s drop leaflets from the sky, leave your homes and go to see four children buried beneath six stories of concrete school notebooks and eggplant she had pickled only a day before with green walnuts. She left to fill buckets of a broken pipe. The F-16s, the F-16s came and the wind hissed. They only went to get some water. She cried for her children melted in phosphorus and walnut shells in a living room in the light of one candle. I only went to get some water. She waits for her husband to return from somewhere, Djibouti, Somalia, wrapped in banana leaves and the empty stare of morning. How many history books will skip the summer of 1982? A woman was stillborn by a water pipe, a plastic bucket to dowel sizzling flesh of four children, the confirmation of anger. She waits for rain, November rain, to seep through slippers and her swollen veins bruised from the pressure of denial. She knows what it's like to be a widow, childless, no wind, no pollen, no country. Poem Current Affairs, I wrote probably eight years ago, and it's still current, at least most of the fans are. And I have not read this poem since I wrote it uh, in any reading. And I did cut out the last two lines, and um, this is not the time to debate, but I thought it would be interesting uh, whether this is a historical document that I should leave alone, or whether uh, I, as the poet, can uh, cut out the last two lines of any poem that I so choose. Um, some, something to think about, and I don't know the answer to that. I want to throw stones in Gaza, 
What little girls in yellow scarves feel the rubber bullets puncturing their eyes and mine. I want to run across the green line in Belfast and Beirut and Sarajevo, back and forth, one by one, pluck the people with my one eye until only the air they breathe divides them. I want to crawl under a moving tank in Tiananmen Square, let the scabbers melt and crush my face. I want to sniff in Medellin, Cartagena, sniff all the coke, smoke all the crack, before they reach schools of Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, sniff until my brain sizzles. I want to dig with my bare hands, red dirt and a child's sigh under my nails, the mass graves in Mozambique, Bosnia, Sabra, and Shatila. I want to swap the flies off hungry children's faces, Eat the mosquitoes off her flaming skin in every refugee camp south of Khartoum. I want to go back and squat on the hot pavement outside Mandela's prison in Cape Town, waiting Mandela. I want to fly over San Salvador, Jerusalem, Mogadishu, let loose a million orange blossoms and sprinkle the lands with rose water. I want to fly over Baghdad, Sarajevo, Luanda, let loose a million orange blossoms and sprinkle the lands with rose water. I want to use Adam and Eve as my parachute and glide down with a billion loads of bread dipped in honey and apples. Last week to hear Professor Barcom um, lecture. It's very good, and I learned stuff, um, a lot of stuff. But something you brought up that um, the Arabs actually did contribute in history. Something good, like the alphabet and math and some some medical stuff. All my life, I um, didn't really know that. It's not something accessible to me every day. What's well, accessible every day is Arabic, Arabic, Arabic. I mean, how many of us would say this today um, in this section? So you've been saying that it, it's there. And, and it hit me on a trip to Spain some years ago. I was standing on a hill, and the tour guide said, the Arabs in the 1400s created the, um, the uh, pipes that the, um, what, what irrigates the land uh, on these hills so that the orange trees can thrive. It hit me that I had not even thought that my, my, my ancestors could do anything that, that interesting or um, more thoughtful. Uh, I mean, really, I mean, this, is, this is internalized racism or self-hatred or what have you, but this is what we fight every day and be my best on that. And it, it's, it's horrific um, when I think about it consciously, but it's just, it's usually just lurks. Uh, and it's very sneaky. It sneaks up on me all the time. So this is this is this defends people sometimes when I read it. Um, but it's called Arabes Despatriados, and it came after the trip to Spain. I'm just reading some things, and, and in one one historical document, and it rumored that the Phoenicians actually, uh, who lived in the Arab world, uh, would sail and actually found America. They didn't conquer it; they just found it. They ran out and they went back. Um, and, and you know, it was way before Columbus. So uh, I read this poem. No one believes me when I say my ancestors found America. Phoenicians in wooden boats sailed the Mediterranean past Carthage and Marseille, the Canary Island, and weeks on rough waters to America. They had olive skin, dark hair, one eyebrow they could read and write. They, read, they traded with Israelites, the Syrians, and when they landed on the new continent, they did not cry out, India. They did not run back for gold or black men. They had the alphabet, they had no use for chains. After years of sailing, they always went home to sight of high people to start of fun, hilly cities facing the sea, facing west, where they built houses and pressed olives. My ancestors built Granada, carved water canals and the earth to feed the orange trees of Andalusia. When I stand on top of a mountain at Orgiva, granada at my feet, water from Vesakia trickling down hillsides, I suck on a sweet fig and imagine my grandfathers planting fig trees before they discovered the new world, before they were labeled Hungaros, Arabes Dispatriados, terrorists. My grandfather's house in Saida faced the sea. He too sailed the Mediterranean past Gibraltar and the Azores to America. In Hermosillo, he found Carmen, her skin as smooth as a sea on August nights. One war broke out, 
He traveled north to California to buy and sell. He grew a mustache and grew tired of trains and the dust clinging to his boots. He sailed back home to Saiga alone and never loved again. In California, in the midst of drought-ridden summers, I can feel my grandfather's longing for the crashing of waves, the salt on Carmen's skin, the dust of Baja, a shot of tequila, and the smell of his textile factory in Hermosillo. When I stand on top of a hill at Scarab's La Chironti and look east, I can see my ancestors sailing in the Mediterranean, heading east, heading home, away from rough Atlantic waters, away from the people who would later call them Bungaros, Arabs, Dispatriados, terrorists. <coughs> Many Arabs went to South America. That's the, the use of the uh, Spanish words. We have a couple more poems. Um, a very short poem called Souvenir. Sometimes it is all a breath away. You feel it on your skin, the sun. A spray of waves, Mary Rose, press a mirror close an arm's length away, and it fogs up with mutilated bodies. I decided to write about the poem yesterday, um, along with you guys. Um, Something happened last week when I was flying down here. Um, I was packing my house to come, and I knew my landlady was going to come and um, do some work in the house. And I, I found a bottle of orange blossom water. I'm mentioning, you might mention that. Um, and, and it has Arabic lettering on it. And I hid it in the cover, in the closet, really uh, not wanting her to um, be suspicious. Because as the other, um, <coughs> Arab lettering is Quranic or Islamic, fundamentalist. Um, it, it, it causes suspicion, and I don't know if some of you might have that experience, but um, I, I was reading the Quran because I hadn't, hadn't read it um, except in passing, and I knew that we were studying it in here. But on the small nine-seater jet, uh, prop jet, from um, where I live to, to the uh, main airport, I didn't feel comfortable pulling out the Quran. Because first of all, I might be searched. I've been searched a lot over the years, and uh, I'm tired. Um, but then, you know, it's just, what's going on? I mean, this is sick. So I decided to um, celebrate this orange blossom and what, why I bought it. I bought it a few weeks ago because I was missing the taste of this um, this milk that's thickened with something I don't know what my grandfather used, and he used orange blossom water and cinnamon. And that is what I was missing. I needed to, to taste that. Um, and I, I dedicate this to my grandfather who died recently. And it's called All That Is Era. There are days when I awake with a taste of my grandfather's warm, thickened milk on my lips. Milk sprinkled with cinnamon and laced with orange blossom. He offers it to me in a bowl with a spoon as if it were soup. April in Lebanon, we sit on the terrace overlooking the Mediterranean in the mild jasmine dawn surrounded by umbrella pines. April in Lebanon, my grandfather would ask me, is the milk sweet enough? And that's all he'd say, leaving so much unsaid, three teaspoons of sugar clanking against his teacup, the reverse thrust of old 707s landing at Beirut Airport puncturing our silent exchange. Later, my grandfather would pick green almonds from the tree, offer them to me dipped in salt while he drank a cold beer. We watched the sunset, April, in Lebanon. We crunched the almonds whole, tasting the bitterness, tasting April, tasting Lebanon, tasting almonds before they turned to almonds, before going inside to watch TV. Thank you.